you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Psalm 66. That's where we're going to be today. As we're looking today, over the next three weeks, it's going to be praising God for what He has done, uh, praising God for what He's doing, and praising God for what He's going to do. And, and we talked about the call to worship earlier where I read you make a joyful noise or shout to the Lord. But the key in that is who's invited to this invitation, to this worship. If you look at verse 1, it's the entire earth. He says, shout for joy, all you inhabitants of the earth. Now, the funny thing is, a lot of us think that's probably historical in context, and and it is, but not only historical. That is a standing invitation to every single person throughout every generation for them to be able to come and discover the greatness of God. And in return, as their heart is filling with awe, as they see who He is and what He's done, It gives them reason to celebrate and rejoice. Matter of fact, in this passage, we're told three reasons how and why we're to celebrate. If you you could follow along, we pick up in 66, verse 5 through 7, and look what it says. It's telling us what we need to do. Come and see what God has done, how awesome His works in man's behalf. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in Him. He rules forever by His power. His eyes watch the nation. Let not the rebellious rise up against Him. Now the word there, the sisala, that is not to be read. If you're reading Psalms, that means to stop, breathe, think about what was just done. So if you're reading Psalms, don't include, don't read the salah. It's a pause moment. You've got to remember, these are songs that were being written. It's a time we pause. It's a time we breathe. It's a time we reflect on what is done. But notice the very first thing it calls us to do. Look what it is. Number one, it's to come and see. The first thing it calls us in point one is to come and see. Now notice what it wants us to look at. Come and look what God has done. Come and look at what God has done. So it's really inviting you uh, to come and see his actions. And they give a very clear description in this verses of exactly what God has accomplished. Notice what it wants us to look at. It wants us to look at verse 5, his awesome deeds. His awesome deeds. Now understand what that is. That God has done something that only God can do. That God has accomplished something that only God can accomplish. In other words, we don't create it, we don't control it, we don't manufacture it. If you pull God out of the situation, what has occurred will not occur, cannot occur. It is an act and a move of God. So we see that word awesome deeds, that's what it means. We're seeing something that is unusual, we're seeing something supernatural, we're seeing what God alone has done. Done. Now, notice something. That intent of us looking at this, this, this exercise of power, this awesome deed, is to do something. It's to create in us an awe towards God, a, a reverence, even a fear. Now, not, a, not, a, not being afraid is terrified, but being in fear of His mighty power. Uh, like many of us know, uh, we use electricity every day. Matter of fact, in this heat, we love electricity. Exactly. AC feels really good, doesn't it, folks? But we know something. We fear electricity. You don't touch those bare wires. You don't stick a fork in the socket. Why? We fear it. We know what's going to happen. That's the same fear. It's a respect. It's an honor that this is someone above us, mightier than us, greater than us. So that's what it does. To look at his greatest awesome deeds inspires us to worship. But, But notice who he does this for. It's very clear. His awesome, his works are done where? In man's behalf. He's doing it for all mankind. God acts on behalf of man to accomplish for him what he cannot accomplish for himself. That's what he does. And for us to understand it, he automatically goes back to what? The history of Israel. He gives two examples here. What's he say? He turned the sea into dry land, and they passed through waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in Him. That starts with the exodus out of of Egypt. Israel had lived in slavery for 400 years. They're under the domination of the world's reigning superpower, Egypt. There's no way they can overthrow them. There's no way they can fight them. Automatically, God comes in inside of 10 plagues. 
He overthrows their gods. He defeats their government to the point that they're being told to leave. And the Bible says that the Egyptians gave them for whatever they asked for. And it said they plundered the land of Egypt. Now, they couldn't have done that on their own. Even if they would have somehow conquered them, they would have had to control them. They couldn't occupy this nation. But with God in control, He did for them what they couldn't do for themselves. He delivered them, and He delivered them with the spoils of of Egypt without lifting a sword or fighting a battle. Now, understand what the Exodus is to a Jewish person. The Exodus was the birthday of the Jewish nation. It was established under Abraham, but it was the birthday of it. That's why they still celebrate the Passover. We see them being delivered. We see them coming out. It is the birthday, too, of the Jewish nation. And, and automatically, that one event is always mentioned in the Old Testament because it's the pinnacle to the Israeli nation, to a Jew, of the supreme, mighty act and power of God. All they have to do is look back to that event and see that power displayed. That's why they go to it. But understand, the Exodus is that pinnacle of power in the Old Testament for the Jew. In the New Testament, it is the resurrection for the believer. Both of us have a pinnacle of God's power put on display. For the Jew, it's the Exodus. For the believer, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, both displaying His awesome deeds. But but notice something. This isn't just being put out there for us to look at. The phrase that says, come and see, also means something else. It means, come and consider. The results, the consequences of God's display of power are now being put on display for anyone to come and look at, for anyone to come and see. It is written in the history, and it's on display for you and for I. And it's there for us to look at and understand and discover God. Now, I need to say something to you guys. So many times we look at this as being an action for someone else, a history for Israel, and we see no implications for ourselves. I need you you to hear something. God's awesome deeds never go out of date. They're not antiquated. They're not just for someone else. In other words, you need to realize I can go back to any awesome deed of God And I can learn who He is. I can learn how He acts. I can learn about God. Because what He did, He still does. What He did, He still does. What He has been, He is. Alexander McLaren, a famous theologian pastor, said this, Faith may feed on all the records of old time and expect the repetition of all that they contain. Do you understand? Those are there for you. They're there for me. For us to look back and say, look how awesome our God is. But guys, we don't just have to look back. We can look now. We have seen what God has done. That's what it's for. But Let's stop and consider what God has done for EHC. What God has done for us this year alone. We have experienced a level of grace that I have to be honest with you, if it were not for God, I have no idea what condition we would be in. At the beginning of our year, we had tragedy. We will not really discuss tragedy or or anything like that. I want to talk about what God did in the midst of that. An event like that should have divided a church, destroyed a church, because it's done it many, many, many times. But it did not us. It's nothing we did. In that moment, our Father poured glorious grace upon this church. And that which was intended to destroy us by the enemy united us. It brought us together. We surrounded our students. Let me give you the greatest example of that. And I can give a picture of this, and I have permission to do this. It was through Miss Nola. When I'm, Christy and I were meeting with her, she said to me, I, I'm going to leave Eagle Heights. And I go, you're going to what? She goes, I have to leave. I go, why do you have to leave? She said, that's what has to happen. You don't understand. The failure is also mine. And I'm like, hold on a second. What do you mean the failure is yours? She goes, I'm associated. This is how it works, Brad. I have to leave. That's what's required. That's what's done. And I go, I don't know what's been done. And I don't care what's been done. That's not who we are. 
I said, we are your family. This is a place of grace. I said, you haven't sinned. You're a victim. And she looked at me. She said, I won't come back unless the elders give me permission. And I looked at her. I go, I can speak for the elders. And they're going to be kind of offended if I ask them this question because I know these men. But I'll ask. And literally, I asked the guys, and they go, why are we asking this question? I'm telling the story. And they're like going, no, she's part of us. And then Nola came back. But guys, do you know how many phone calls we got? How many phone calls she got of other churches, other ministers, other people going, we've never seen a church do that? Why were we able to do that? Because we're great? No, because our God is. He poured grace upon us. He united us. He delivered us. What was intended for evil was done for good. That was grace. And it didn't stop there. I've watched God's grace begin to change us, change me, change you. Do you know how many calls I'm getting from people that are saying, I need to talk. Our staff are getting these calls. Small group leaders are getting these calls. God drawing people to Himself. I've had multiple conversations from men, Christy with women, who are coming in and they're saying, I don't know what's going on. I just want to be closer to God. What do I need to do? Do you realize no one seeks God? No one desires God? If God is putting that in you, it's Him. Grace. I've had more people come saying, you know what? I want to see this person saved. I don't know what I got to do. I don't know how to do. I'm just going to start praying. I have heard more tear-filled requests from this church than I ever have. Do you know what that is? It is grace. And I saw it put perfectly at camp. Wednesday night. Services are over. Cabin time's over. The boys, some of the boys decide to stay downstairs and just read Scripture and play and worship. That is not what boys normally do at camp. I don't know if you know that. That's not it. But then more boys came down, and then more boys came down, and then girls came down. And for a couple hours, they just praised God. They just shared their favorite verses. Four students got saved. No one's preaching the gospel. No one's giving an invitation. None of that. Do you know what they saw? They saw what they saw in Acts 2.42, where the disciples devoted themselves to the disciples' teaching. They broke bread. They took the Lord's Supper daily. They worshiped. They sold their goods. They shared it. And the Bible says the Lord added to their number daily. They saw grace. They saw something in us. You must understand the reality of the grace of God is dripping on our church, folks. We didn't do any of this. And guess what? If he wouldn't have done it, none of this would have happened. None of it. Eagle Heights, we have been blessed with grace. And guess what? It may not be happening in every church, but my prayer is that it does. Because this isn't about us. This is about the glorious name of our amazing God who loves people and wants nothing more for them to come to Him. It's about Him. It's about His name being made great. This is not a contest. This is a campaign that our fathers called us to to show how amazing He truly is. Come and see that the Lord is good. But then it says something else. The, the, the text goes on. After we come and see, we're called to come and praise. Praise our God, O peoples. Let the sound of His praise be heard. Now that word in some of your Bibles, instead of praise, it's going to say bless. It's calling us to bless God for what He has done. Bless God, point A, for what He has done. I love the word bless because its definition is praise, but there's a word picture that comes with it. That verb is derived from a word where we get our word, knee. Have you ever thought about how people are blessed in Scripture? God is blessing people. What do we see? Them kneeling before God. David, when he's anointed king of Israel, kneels before God as Samuel anoints him with the anointing oil for him to be the next king. But notice something. In this place, we're blessing God for what He has done. We're blessing God. So the call is it's a moment of prayer where we kneel and bless Him for what He has done. Where we stop and we sound His praise. Eagle Heights, after hearing what you just heard, after seeing what we've seen, we cannot take another step until we obey this verse. So I'm inviting you now, if you're physically able and you're free to do so, Would you kneel with me and let's bless our God? Please kneel with me. We can't take another step until we do this. Dear Jesus, thank you. 
that you have shown your grace to us. That you have looked past our unworthiness and our failures and our selfishness. You've taken us and rescued us from our sin. When we were unworthy and unwanted, you saved us. And now, in your goodness and your love, you decided to shine your face on us and share your glory in our midst and, and pour your grace on us when we needed it the most. And Father, we know one thing. We can't earn that. We don't deserve that. But we can stop and acknowledge it, can't we? You didn't ask us to do anything but praise you and to honor you and to worship you. And that's what we do in this moment. We say, thank you, Jesus. We say, thank you, Jesus. We say, thank you. Because there's not a God like you. There is no other God like you. We love you. We honor you. We had nothing to do with this, but we thank you for sharing it with us and including us. Begin to do this in every church, God. We want your name great. But God, at the beginning, we must establish one thing. No matter what you do, it's about you and it's not about us. We will not touch your glory. We don't create it. We don't control it. But God, the moment it becomes about us, we can destroy it quickly. It's about you. We honor you. Bless his name. And Eagle Heights said amen by saying, bless his name name. Say it with me. Bless his name. I'm still preaching. But then it says one last thing, and notice what it is. Go and declare. Go and declare. Come and listen. Now stop right there. It says, wait, whoa, whoa. it says, come, come, stop. The temple was the place of declaration because it was the presence of God was there. The throne was the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. God's presence was on the throne. By the way, if you want to know where the ark is, Indiana Jones got it wrong. It is in heaven in the temple according to Revelation 12, 4. That's where it is. It, you can't build a franchise of movies off that, I understand, but okay. But what did they do? They came into God's presence and they repented. They declared His greatness through worship. They declared His greatness through sacrifice. In the Old Testament, that, the temple was the center of declaration. Now, understand something. Something hasn't changed. God still sits on the throne in His temple. But the location of that temple has changed. Notice what it says. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? In the Old Testament, you said, come and see, come and listen, come and praise. In the New Testament, you don't have to go to a temple. The temple is going to them. The temple goes and said, let me tell you about my amazing God. Let me tell you what he's done for me. Let me just worship him. You know what we do? We just be salt and light. And people are drawn to that kind of grace. Matter of fact, this summer, our students have been going for ghost students through the convention off and on. We've had them in Tulsa. We've had them in London. We've had them in Portland. They just got back this weekend, uh, to, or this week from Portland. But I've asked Jeff and Aiden Hobbs to come and give a brief testimony to you about what God has been doing in, in, through Go students. So would you give Jeff and Aiden a hand as they make their way to the stage? They've had the privilege of being in London. They've had the privilege of being in London. And so we're going to invite them up. I think, or Aiden, are you starting? Okay. All right. All right, so we were in Swindon, England, an hour away from London. It's a very small town. 99% of the population is unreligious, and there's only four churches like this one. And we just, most of the time, we were doing street evangelism. One day, we were knocking on doors. One day, we were just, just a tourism day. But the rest of it was out in the middle of of the city just sharing the gospel with strangers and our pastor he just wanted one contact that was it wow. but he was blown away because we got 12 contact numbers and one person got saved amen yes. that's amazing and that's about it i'll pass it to my dad now 
Yeah, so we would do this, uh, my technique and street evangelism stunk, but it got better as the week went on, but it was, it was funny, we had to quit about three o'clock because day drinking is an English sport, and so you had to get out of there and, and everything, but what we, um, there were two things that, that really stuck out to me is we used the, the three circles method of evangelism that we all learned, um, and, and the key word there is brokenness. Okay, we didn't talk sin, we talked the effects of sin, brokenness. And, and we live in this world, England is, is just like the United States. People are miserable. People, people are broken and, and they're hurting. We have seen, I think of my grandfather, and you've all seen people dying of cancer, dying in pain, and when they're filled with the joy of the Lord, they're just happy. And people with money, food, clothing. They're just broken and miserable. And, and the other key word I, I, I thought about was boldness. We had Aiden and five other Oklahoma high school students walking up to Englishmen in business suits, refugees from the Middle East. Boldness, just going up to them and, and sharing their faith. And, and Brad talked about the boldness of these students um, sharing their faith. Um, at my school where I teach, uh, I got a text you know, we, we have an informal network of, of Christian teachers and, and sometimes pray for so-and-so, he's sharing the gospel. You know, and so it, it's time to be, to be bold uh, because this world is so broken. And, and it's such an honor to be a teacher. It's an honor to, to work with these youth. And, and I have to tell you, it's kind of one of those adults, it's parents, it's one of those lead, follow, get out of the way type things because these, these kids are passionate for the Lord and be praying for their teammates, their classmates, their, their bandmates, because the gospel will get shared. There will be lots of gospel conversations in the next month. Right, guys? All right, thanks. Now, I want you to notice in the text, when we get to verse 316, it changes, doesn't it? Before, it's been to the entire world, but now it's not this huge plural thing anymore. Look what it says. Come and listen, all you fear God. Let me tell you what God has done for me. Let me declare what God has done for me. You declare what God has done for you. Now, he goes on to say in this section, and I'll I'll wrap this up quickly. He goes on to say, I prayed, he answered. I prayed, he answered. That's really summed up the end of the book. But you know what, guys? If we don't pray, he doesn't answer. You do not have because you do not ask. We have so much to pray for, guys. Let me give you one thing we're going to focus on today. Every one of you in this church is going to get one of these free bracelets that are right here on the front. We're asking everyone because we're asking you to pray for our teachers and pray for our students. These with a sticker on it that said Eagle Heights Church is praying for you are different. These are to be given by you to someone you're praying for. Students, I'm going to encourage you to give it to another student. Or maybe to a teacher. Teacher, you can do the same. You can give it to one of your students if you're allowed to and you have that freedom. Uh, Parents, you can give it to a teacher and let them know, hey, you've got my kid, I'm praying for you. I mean, I understand that. But all of them is the same thing. We're asking God to move in their life. For the grace of God that came to me is the grace of God that comes to them. But guys, if we don't pray and we don't ask, we're coming to God to do what we cannot do. There's one thing we can't do is we can't change people's lives. We couldn't clean ourselves up. What makes you think they can? They need rescue, and that starts with prayer. Notice this didn't start with, here's the five points of evangelism. You need to memorize this. You need to do this. It doesn't matter where you are in your faith. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter how much you know or don't know. All of us can pray. And we can all go before our Father and say, God in heaven, I gave this to so-and-so. I need you to move in their life now. At the end of the service, When you take one of these for yourself, and those are in these baskets here, this basket is going to be over here. And if God has laid someone you're to share this with, I want you to come and get it. But before we do that, we're going to pray over these bracelets as a church. 
We're closing today asking for God to continue to do. And we can see then what God is doing. Who He was, He is. What He has done, He will do. It's all unconnected. As your head are bowed and your eyes are closed, I want you to think of one thing, one name. Who do I need to pray for? It can be someone at work. It can be a neighbor. It can be a family member. It doesn't matter. Who can I pray for? Who do I need to give this bracelet to? Who do I need to give this bracelet to? I'm going to give you a second to talk with God for that answer to be filled in for you. Now let's pray for them. Father, right now, you call us to go and declare. To talk about who you are and what you've done for us. There's so much you've done for us, God. We're so thankful for that. But Lord, right now, everyone in this room is praying for someone. Praying for someone to be saved. Praying for someone to be returning to their faith. Uh, I don't know what that prayer request is, God. But we're praying for them. Lord, as that person's laid on their heart, Would you, in turn, Father, give the person praying the courage to come get a bracelet and take it to them? And just let them know, hey, I'm praying for you. If there's anything I can pray for you, can tell me. I'll take it to the Lord, and I will pray for you. Please know, no matter what happens, I'm here, and I'm praying for you. I love what Jeff said. There's so much darkness in this world. There's so much dark. London is such a dark place. But that darkness is no less. It may not be as prominent here because churches are so active and they've died in the, in the, in the UK. But Father, that can happen here if we do not declare your greatness. So right now, Father, we don't want to talk about all this. We just want to start the first step of prayer. We need you to, keep, to do outside of our church what you're doing inside of our church in us. Help us to just go and declare. Whatever that looks like, but it starts with prayer, God. It starts with prayer. Lord, I love you. I thank you. Father, more than anything else, we did this service and the next two services to say one thing. We love you. And we recognize what you've done, and all the glory goes to you. Father, empower us to show your love so we can share your life as the Spirit leads. And all of Eagle Heights said, Amen.